Right, well, um, I'd like to welcome you, obviously, to the Halifax Rugby League Heritage, uh, basically, lunch club, albeit we're not in a club and we're not having lunch. <laughs> but we Thank you for your hospitality. <laughs> yes, we're yeah. still trying to keep in touch with the people who would have attended the club because obviously there are some quite vulnerable people in there in terms of isolation etc and we just thought this would be a way of still reaching out to them um and it, if i'm correct you actually came to this year to do one of the challenge cup draws and that's when malcolm basically buttonholed you and said <laughs> oi yeah and you'd agreed to come to the lunch anyway Yes, I think I think I was due to have a nice lunch with you today. Yes, um, yes. but uh, unfortunately we can't for all the obvious reasons. But yeah, yeah. Um, when Malcolm said, "Would I like to come?" Then you know, great, I'd love to come. Um, if it's a day, an hour, even five minutes chatting rugby league, then uh, you well, can't knock yes. that, can you? <laughs> and I mean, in terms of chatting rugby league, um, can I take you right back to the start? First memories of rugby league? Was it something you were into as a kid? Was it something your relatives took you to see? Well, my dad, my dad took me to watch my first game of rugby league, and I, I, I tell this story quite a lot. He took me to watch my first game of rugby league. He tells me when I was two years old. Um, so I was introduced to rugby league before I've got any kind of memory of the game. So yeah. I, I always say that. It, rugby league became an important part of my life, has always been an important part of my life, um, even before I can remember. So he took me to watch uh, Wigan. He was, um, it's a strange story really, because my dad's family are all from Bolton, they're farmers in Bolton, uh, and my mum's family are all Wiganers. And uh, my mum's family, none of them have ever had any interest in rugby league whatsoever but my dad uh, my dad when he was a young young lad um, used to go he was a football fan um, and then he went watching Lee against Wigan uh, one one match one of his mates had told him to go along and he'd gone and watched it and Wigan had a player you might have heard of him a player called Billy Boston who uh, uh, who just signed it, maybe uh, maybe yeah and my dad said he just thought, wow, I'm going to watch this fella every week. So he became a Wigan fan um, because Wigan had just signed Billy Boston. So he went watching Wigan every week and he went with a couple of his mates watching Wigan on a regular basis and they would therefore go um, socialising in Wigan. Um, at, at the, I think it was the Palais or the Empire or something on a, on a, on a night time, um, having gone watching the Rugby League. And uh, he met my mum. Um, on one of those nights oh, out. Nice. So I always say that if Wigan hadn't signed Billy Boston, <laughs> I might not be here. <laughs> so I have, I have thanked Billy. I have, uh, I have taken. My, he looked a bit confused when I told him, but I said thank you very much, Billy, because if you weren't here, I wouldn't be here. Uh, so yeah, so um, so I grew up as a Wigan Wigan rugby league fan from being a young a young baby, basically. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever join a community club? Did you ever play yourself? No, uh, again, being in Bolton, uh, I mean, it's this strange thing about rugby league, especially in Lancashire, I think less so in Yorkshire. But in Lancashire, um, you, I grew up in Bolton, which is 12 miles from Wigan, where rugby league is a religion. It's, you know, 10, 12 miles from Lee, where rugby league is, you know, is a huge influence as well. Yet in Bolton, uh, hardly anyone bothered about rugby league. Um, so I was, I was kind of in an area where there wasn't a lot of rugby league going on, um, even though I was a fan. So I played rugby union at school um, and my mate Kev, uh, who came from Wigan, he came to our school from Wigan, um, he became my mate because he was a rugby league fan. He was a Wigan rugby league fan. Um, he played at Wigan St. Pat's for a while and he did yeah. say to me, why don't you come down and play at St. Pat's? But um, I wasn't good enough and I wasn't brave enough and I wasn't fast enough. So, <laughs> so all those reasons, I never actually played rugby league. I played rugby union as a school kid, but I never played rugby league. Yeah. 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 Um, and so you don't have much background as a youngster apart from obviously going to watch the game. Yeah. Was the rugby, was that what led you into journalism or was journalism a separate idea that just in the future happened to find that rugby league dovetailed in well here's another story i'm sorry for boring you with this story no 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 these are what we want yeah when i was at school so i was about 15 or 16 probably 15 at this stage 
uh, and I was in an English lesson and the English teacher, a gentleman called Mr. Winder, who I have a lot to thank for, um, he decided we would all read. He, he was going to give us all a book to read and uh, he would pick a book and he would give us a book and uh, we had to read it over the following week and talk about it the week after. And he gave me a book and he said, you'll like this. And it was a book called uh, There is a Happy Land by Keith Waterhouse. Uh, and uh, you, yep. you, you'll have heard of Keith Waterhouse, fine Hunslet yep. lad, um, uh, big mate Willie Hall, who was also a uh, Hunslet lad as well. Uh, and so I read this book by Keith Waterhouse, and it was about a kid in a working class community in Leeds, in Hunslet, presumably. And I just thought this is brilliant because he's describing a lot of my own experiences growing up as a working class kid. Um, you know, the playing in the back streets, you're having your gang of mates, the stories they emerge and stuff like that. I really associated with this book. So I thought, wow. Uh, so I read another of his books, which you will have heard of, which is Billy Liar, uh, obviously yep, became yep. very famous as a film. And again, I associated a lot with that as well, because it was about, um, you know, at, at that stage, a teenage lad who, who had all kinds of, you know, flights of fancy. And that was a bit like me as well as a teenager. So I thought this Keith Waterhouse knows a thing or two. I'll find out a bit more about him and what he became. And he became a journalist. Keith Waterhouse was a journalist with the Daily Mirror at the time. So I decided at 15, 16, with this obsession of Keith Waterhouse, I'm going to be a journalist. So um, I've made that decision there and then. Uh, and then um, when I was in the sixth form, um, I thought, right, I need to act on this. So I sent a letter to my local newspaper, the Bolton Evening News, and I followed it up with a phone call to the sports editor and said, I want to be a journalist. And I've noticed, I'm a big rugby league fan, I've noticed you don't put a lot of rugby league in your newspaper. Let me do some rugby league for you. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, you go off and cover a match and uh, we'll see what it's like. So I went and did a match at Headingley, uh, Leeds against Wigan. Uh, in 1984 and I it was either the Regal Trophy or the John Player I can't remember because that competition was the same competition wasn't it but yeah, it was called yeah, the John yeah. Player and then became I can't remember which version of it it was but I'd wrote a match report and John Holmes was playing for Leeds um, uh, uh, John Ferguson I don't know if you remember the winger who came over yeah, yeah. Canberra, who was brilliant he was playing um, and Leeds won the game and I did the match report and sent it in on the Saturday night and they used it word for word in the Monday newspaper and um and I just wow that's brilliant so that was it I, I then I then decided I want to be a journalist and I'm going to be you know rugby league is is my love so that's where we'll go so um while I was in sixth form the Peter Mensford from the Bolton Evening News put me in touch with an agency in Wigan and he said these are the people who normally do our rugby league for us go and see what they can do for you so I went and did a lot of work experience working for this agency and how the agency worked was uh, they would cover, we, we had a big area, Wigan, Preston, Chorley, Ormskirk. We covered that as a news patch Monday to Friday. If we found stories, we wrote them and we sold them to either the national newspapers, the regional newspapers or the radio. And then on Saturdays, we covered Wigan Athletic and Preston North End when they were home. And we covered Wigan Rugby League on Sunday. And one of my jobs there was to do rugby league stories on a weekly basis as well so it was at the time when graham Lowe had just started as the new coach yeah, yeah. um obviously clark and mckinnis had taken wigan to wembley in 85 um i can't remember who uh, who they beat actually uh, in, in 85 uh, oh it was hull it was a great hull final wasn't it um yeah. and um uh, and then um so graham Lowe had taken over maurice Lindsay was in his pomp and so it was a very exciting time. So I, 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 I was work experience there and then I did my A-level, A-levels and on the, the last day of my A-level exams, uh, the day after I went and started working at the agency, I didn't go to university. Um, I just wanted to start working as a journalist. They offered me a job. Uh, so I went there and spent uh, about four years working for them, learning an awful lot about journalism very exciting times um, as well with the Wigan Rugby League story that was developing and they were becoming better and better and uh, doing a bit of radio, doing a bit of newspaper and then eventually um, moving over to Radio Leeds in 1990. Um, 1990, to, yeah. 1990 mm -hmm. to become, um, well, I went there originally as a news reporter, but I always had my eye on the Rugby League job. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't long before I was doing Rugby League on Radio Leeds. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's how it went. So... 
Having covered Wigan for all those years, you go across the hill, you come to God's own county. Yeah. Um, you start with Radio Leeds. So were you then covering any club at any time or did you pick up a favourite club when you came to Radio Leeds or was it just studio work? No, it was it was great really because um, we well, I mean it was a great we had a great a great few years there um, working at Radio Leeds. Uh, people might remember Dave Callahan, who sadly passed away last yeah, year, yeah. who used to do Yorkshire cricket and a lot of Leeds United. We had uh, Miles Harrison was there for a time. He's there. He's now well has been for many years. Sky's number one rugby union commentator, yeah, yeah. Uh, a guy called Peter Drury, who uh, worked a lot for BBC Telly and ITV, and now does a lot of, of work around the world. So it was a great time to be there. And uh, Leeds United won the championship um, in the in the second year I was there, I think. But I was left to look after the rugby league. So we had a, a program on a Sunday afternoon, which I think started at two o'clock and ran through till six. And um, during the week, I'd go off and interview various coaches. So I would cover all the clubs. So I think we had, I think who was uh, we had Dave Topless at Wakefield at the time. Uh, Roger Millward, of course, at Halifax for a while. Yeah, Malcolm, yeah. Malcolm really at Halifax for a while as well. So interviewing them on a regular basis, which was a thrill. Um, Leeds, Dougie Lawton uh, uh, at that stage. Uh, Castle, I can't remember who Castleford would have been at that point. Daryl Van Der Velt, probably. Yeah, yeah, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Daryl, Daryl Van Der Velt. Um, and, and covering all the clubs, uh, Dewsbury, Batley, Hunslet. You know, it wasn't just... Um, the, the, the top tier clubs at that stage it was it was all the clubs so and of course that was back in the days of the old first division second division because we hadn't had the uh, the super league revolution no, at no, that stage no. so but yeah and in that time and uh, in that time Wigan were doing really well obviously and, and it got a bit boring because they were winning everything and so you kind of lose the passion a little for that reason but also because I was interviewing some of these great uh, great people in Yorkshire, coaches, players. Then I kind of got a little bit of an affection for, uh, for for the for the West Yorkshire sites as well. So the Wigan Rugby League King thing has kind of worn off uh, now, and and I'm, I don't have any kind of feelings for Wigan at all at this stage. Yeah, something that comes to mind is is um, so the reporters' box, shall we say, at Thrum Hall was up some really rusty. Ladders up into the, if I remember right, a gantry on the on the stand there, wasn't there? Yeah. Uh, so, have you a memory of that going up there? Because I bet that was some wild cold place. No, I don't think I ever went into the gantry. I used to go oh. the press the press box at the back. There was a press back, box at the, the back. back row. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think I ever went up the gantry. Oh, um, right. um, they may have altered it. Health and safety might have taken it out. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I don't think I ever did a television commentary at Thrum Hall. Oh, right. um, I was still only doing radio at that, at that stage. So yeah, yeah. I think around the eighties, the gantry bit had been deemed as a no-go area. Right. Right. The cameras yeah, used to bring scaffolding of their own along. Yeah, um, I did used to write for the League Express, and I do remember at the back on the left, the back row of the stand with the little tip-up tables. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Which, uh, that, that, the Halifax game, there, there was a, a place, a, a gantry at Barrow, at, at, at Craven Park at Barrow, and I can remember Ray French telling me a story that they went to do a, a TV match there one year, uh, and they'd not been for years and years, um, and um, it had stained glass windows. Really? So they, and they had to take the windows out because to get the cameras <laughs> right. through and, and all the furore that was caused because these stained glass windows had to be taken out. Yeah, so I don't right. think they had stained glass windows at Halifax. I remember the, the toilets behind, <laughs> the toilets behind the stand. Uh, very well, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So have you, have you, while we're at Thrumall, have you any specific memories of the place itself? Because obviously... The history means an awful lot to the yeah. people that we'll be going out to. Yeah, I loved I loved Thrumall. I really loved Thrumall. Um, just the the whole aspect of it, um, the setup of it, you know, with the bowling green and and, and the cricket club, etc. Um, yeah, and and the old I remember the old um, uh, pavilion as well, where all the offices were. Mm. Uh, I think. Oh, there's several several games. I remember going there as a Wigan fan, 
uh, in a league game, I think it was, or it might have been a Challenge Cup tie, and Halifax winning 3-2. Does that sound about right? Um, it was a very low-scoring game. Mm. I, think, um, I think Barry Williams, who you might not remember, was a Welsh winger that Wigan had. I think he scored. So it, 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 well, that I was a think three Wigan won 3-2. In was that, that what game. it was? Right. And I think, bless his cotton socks, Terry Fogarty actually dropped the ball over the try line. Right. Mm. I actually remember that game. Yeah. If, yeah. If, do you feel that I was think, Do you think, think that was a midweek one? Because there's a little. If it is, it might be the one that John Burnett, who was the captain for you know centre, he told me once. He said because uh, because the majority of the others were all working full time, and he was an engineer, fitter shop. Uh, just about half a mile up from Thrumhall, going up the hill, and said to me, we're a Wednesday night, a Wednesday evening game, They're all fans have just got out boozing. He says, I'm here, tried to finish a job, before I go and captain the side that they're going to watch. He said, yeah, yeah. And apparently <laughs> it was a huge crowd, some 20 odd thousand on a midweek, and I think that was a cup tie. Whether it's the same, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, can't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know the year. I, I wouldn't no. be able to remember the year. It um, sounds similar with Fogarty in it and others. It, that, Time yeah. Of the era. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I remember that game. I remember a cup tie a little more up to date when Wigan were in that run. So it would have been yes. 91, 92, and Mark Preston played for Halifax. And I think it was a really snowy day. I actually watched it. I wasn't working that day. I'd just gone and stood with Halifax fan, fans in the old scratching shed. And, and I think Joe Lydon kicked a drop goal. He dropped something. a goal about a yeah. minute from the end to win yeah. 1918. Yeah. Broke uh, my heart. It has to be yeah. said. <laughs> yeah. 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 So yeah. I remember that. I, I also remember, this will be a painful memory, the, uh, the World Club Challenge game against nice. Brisbane as well. So, yeah, that wasn't great, was it? No, no. no. So you're working at, at Radio Leeds. Um, so this is the old joke about um, it doesn't matter what you look like when you work for the radio. Yeah. But then eventually you're doing TV work as well. Yeah. So I was working at Radio Leeds, and at the time that I was doing rugby league at Radio Leeds, Harry Gration uh, was Radio Five Lives rugby league man. Yeah. Um, so every now and again, when Harry had a, a week off, uh, he would do a match on a Sunday and then do a roundup for the bulletins in the evening on the Sunday. And whenever Harry had a, a week off, for whatever reason, they'd say to me, oh, can you do the roundup? So when Harry made the decision to join the Rugby Football League as their uh, press officer, yeah, uh, which which I maintain is the best decision he ever took, <laughs> because uh, Five Live then said to me, "Oh, do you fancy being <laughs> yes. a rugby league man?" So I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. That's fantastic." So um, I then moved on to Five Live, and then um, having worked for Five Live for a few years, um, the telly people asked. Well, they actually asked the nineteen, which World Cup? Nineteen ninety five World Cup when uh, they asked a few of us just to, because they said, we're going to need more than one commentator. We've got Ray French, we're going to need more than one commentator. And so they asked a few of us to just go in for a little test uh, to see how it went on. So um, we did that, but they gave a job. I was heartbroken at the time. They gave a job to Terry Fogarty, um, uh, who became became the number two commentator uh, during the World Cup in 95. Um, but then after that, uh, they started offering me a, a few p- bits and pieces. And then eventually I became uh, Ray's official number two, French's official number two. And then when Ray decided to retire um, or, or, or to stand down a little bit, didn't want to do as much, then they said to me, will you do, will you become the first, the number one? Which I'd said, well, well you don't even have to ask me. <laughs> no, no. That's, that's, uh, that's the biggest thrill professionally I think I've ever had. So I, I commentated on the final. The first Challenge Cup final I did was 2009, which was um, some team just down the road from Halifax, begins with a H, uh, against Warrington. And um, um, so that was, for me, that's been the biggest thrill in my career, it, professionally, just just yeah, you know, yeah. to do that. Because they've only had... The BBC started doing TV com- coverage of Rugby League in 1954, I think was the first televised Cup final that went national. And it was, of course, Eddie Waring. And Eddie carried on doing that job till 1981 when Frenchie took over. And Frenchie carried on doing the job till 2009 when I took over. So uh, for me, it's such an honour 
uh, such a privilege that the BBC have only ever had three people commentating on a Challenge Cup final since the 1950s. And to be one of those three is just, well, it, it, it makes my heart swell. I'm, 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 oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sure drunk. it does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I have to say, um, I spent 35 years in teaching, but the way you've described your job from its progression through was the job that I, I always wanted to do. Yeah. Starting the, you know, because starting the radio and then the yeah. national radio. Then t- so I'm hugely jealous and you've every right to be proud of only being the third ever. Yeah. Uh, c- yeah. Just because c- as, a, as a flip side to those two successes, I, I you know, I've clearly followed Halifax and I was going home and away at the time and hospital radio for whatever reason said, can you, can you ring us straight after a game? It was a telephone box you to find, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go on, yeah, go on, I'll do that. And they gave me some lead, what to do, and I was rubbish at that one. I, I did it too fast. So I did it again the following week, and I was too slow. I said, oh, it's a load of rubbish. <laughs> it, it, it clearly wasn't going to be my track. <laughs> well, he, I mean, you say that, Matt. Um, I only got into radio. I've had two big, big accidents in my life, uh, which have taken me down a career that I probably didn't think I was going down. The first of those was when I was at the agency back in back in the the eighties. Um, I didn't. I was never interested in radio. I didn't want to do radio. I just wanted to be a newspaper reporter. Um, no interest at all in broadcasting. And then, um, and, and, and like I said before, we used to do Wigan Athletic and Preston North End on a Saturday. And we used to do one or two rate for local radio stations. You know, so for example, if Preston were playing. Um, uh, Torquay, Radio Devon wouldn't send a reporter, no. they'd ask us to do it for them, that kind of stuff. But I was never interested in that. But one Thursday, um, the boss at the place where I worked dropped dead with a heart attack, just very suddenly, totally unexpected. And so on the Friday, it was kind of, well, that's, you know, incredibly sad and incredibly tragic. We've still got a job to do tomorrow. Um, so you're going to have to go and do some radio. So they sent me to do Preston North End against Swansea for BBC Radio Wales. And it terrified me, absolutely (laughs) terrified me. Um, And I did it. And they said, right, you can do that every week now. And literally every week we'd find out on the Wednesday or Thursday um, if I had to do radio. If I knew I was going to have to do radio on Saturday, I, I didn't sleep. I didn't, I couldn't eat. I was just so terrified, Mm. but I had to do it because it was a job. But slowly you kind of get used to that and slowly um, it kind of becomes suddenly an enjoyment rather than to have to endure it. The other big accident that took me down a path I would never have expected was I was living in Bradford at the time up at Queensbury, which is uh, overlooking Halifax, obviously. Mm -hmm. And um, I was was living up there and got a phone call on a Friday night. I was working for Five Live at this stage. And for Five Live, I was a rugby league reporter. And also I did features on other sports during the week. Um, But I didn't do anything else. But they rang me on a Friday um, in the mid-afternoon to say, you're going to have to do a football commentary tonight. I said, well, why? And they said, well, the reporter, the commentator who is due to cover Burnley against Berry, has had a car accident on the motorway on the way up. Um, so he's, he's, he's fine, but he's not able, he doesn't want to carry on. He just, you know, wants to go home now. So I said, right. And they said, you're the only person living as you do on the, 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 the frozen wastelands of Queensbury who can get to Burnley in time. Mm. So I went and did a commentary. And then on the Monday, they said, right, you know, a football commentator. And I had no intention of being, I, I had no, football for me doesn't do it. You know, I've always been rugby league. Football doesn't really do it. But on the back of that one incident, I ended up doing five football World Cups. Um, I've, 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 I've done Champions Leagues and Premier League, Europa League all over the world. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's just, it's amazing where life takes you sometimes. Yeah, yeah. When you least expect it. And, and you hadn't planned for it. You hadn't no. planned for it. No. Wow. All that travelling and... Yeah. Various parts of the world as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know, sorry, I know well, Malcolm was, was talking to me earlier that you'd mentioned that you'd been to a, a heritage club before, somewhere in Lancashire. You were telling me, when I, when I spoke to you at uh, the Shea, you, you mentioned how you'd, was it that same day or the, the day previous, you'd gone with your dad to... Um, yeah, I I hadn't gone. I hadn't I hadn't gone with him, but uh, my dad went. Um, um, he, he my dad's my dad's in a home uh, now, um, and he he hadn't been in uh, for about 
they haven't been in for more than a, a month or so, settle in straight away. Absolutely loves it. Absolutely loves it. Um, and his only frustration at the moment is he can't get Sky. Uh, but uh, other than that, he's, he's, having, he's, he's really good. Um, but what they arranged for him uh, was they took him to the Wigan Heritage Club. Um, and uh, he, he just had an absolute, he had a fantastic time. Uh, absolutely brilliant because they were showing matches, uh, clips of matches that he remembered being at. But I think the biggest thrill for him was that um, Ray Ashby was there. Don't, do you remember Ray Ashby? Yes, yes. He, was, uh, he rings bells with me, yeah. He was a Lance Todd winner. It was the first time Ashby and um, um, oh, Gabitas, Ashby and Gabitas, in the 65, 65 Challenge Cup final, shared the Lansdale Trophy. Ray Ashby was the Wigan fullback, Gabitas was the Hunslet hooker. Um, and um, so Ray Ashby was there. Now, of course, that was my dad's era. And, and so him and my dad sat chatting. And I don't know if you've met Ray. Um, I've met Ray a few times down the years. And he's just the loveliest bloke. He's just such a lovely bloke. Um, and him and my dad sat down and just chatted about matches that Ray had played in. Mm. And my dad had watched. And um, so that that night, my dad rang and said, oh, I just had the best oh, day. Oh, oh, oh. You know, <laughs> it was just, yeah, so thrilled. Mm. So thrilled, yeah. So it's... I'm going to say, through the Halifax Heritage once, it's something that we always find anyway. You get these blokes who, when you were little, they were your heroes and you looked up to them and they were almost gods. And then when you chat, and some of them could be, particularly, you know, if you're playing in the sort of the 60s and the early 70s, big and rough and tough and mean and quite thuggish at times and yeah. yet such lovely quiet gentlemen off the park yeah. and would, would do anything for the people who come to our meeting yeah 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 i mean we are blessed in our sport because we've got some fabulous characters i think um i was chatting to this with dave hadfield a few years back who's the former uh, independent journalist who yes. for me is the doyen of, of rugby league journalists um, and we were saying about, you know, how many, there's so many great characters in rugby league. And his theory was that it is such a tough sport to play. You know, you've got to have a certain amount of integrity and courage and it weeds out the buttons. Mm -hmm. You know, if, yeah. if, if yeah. you're, if you're a bit weak, level, yeah. you don't, you don't, you know, you don't mm -hmm. make it. So it, it, there's a lot of good people in rugby league and that's one of the reasons why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you, as you say, it, uh, at the level that you get to, and bearing in mind that in those days of the part-time rugby, the extra earnings made the difference between getting by and being quite well off. So you wouldn't want to deliberately deprive somebody of their, um, basically, ability to work and earn money. No, no. Having said that, did you ever see any of Jim Mills's play? <laughs> <laughs> Jim Mills was the mm -hmm. very first guest mm -hmm. at our very first heritage. Yeah. Yeah. Top bloke. Yeah, Brilliant bloke. Brilliant bloke. That was what I meant about rough and raw yeah. bone. Yeah. Backward yeah. step was not in his vocabulary. No, no. No, he told some good tales, didn't he? Some, you know, many of which people uh, think they've heard, but he put a little bit more depth in there, didn't he? And, 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 and clearly the one, um, his, his big one with the New Zealand guy, you know, uh, forgotten. John Greengrass. Greengrass, yeah. yeah. He says, Greengrass, yeah. Yeah, he says, we're big mates. Now, you know, yeah, oh, that's gone, yeah. but it's, it's history, but it's, oof, what's his bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah really yeah. Good. I think that's what we've found, isn't it, in... Um, and we've always said that to me, you know, come along, um, listen to the stories, and then we'll, they'll start off with things that you've, most people have heard of, but then they've gone into that little bit of, you know, backstory. Clearly, yeah. we don't want to, you know, um, uh, get too naughty, possibly, but all the, all the people that have been involved, you know, with referees turning up and giving us a bit of their... Um, who's, who's the one, Ian, that... I remember, we got him over from Huddersfield. He never gave a penalty in, in, in the game at all. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was um, Colin Morris. Colin Morris. Colin Morris. Yeah, that's right. Colin, we've had Colin and John Oldsworth, haven't we? Yes. Um, and I remember being at that game. I think Halifax played Hull, and then there was just a big murmur going around the last ten minutes. Can't give it. And I think the players found out that too. Well, that was yeah. it. They, they, yeah. they got away with absolute murder that last ten minutes. <laughs> he wasn't <laughs> going to change his mind. <laughs> really good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Good. And as we move in more 
up to date because of the situation we're in and lots of things being online and what have you you're heavily involved with the our league yeah yeah um, they yeah they, they've asked they've asked they asked me at the start of the season just to do they do a try of the week um so at the start of the season obviously you'd look back at the weekend that we just had in in um super league championship league one and and the community game as well and they pick out five or six tries and then i'd like talk around them as to why these were great tries but then obviously we we lost the action but they wanted to keep that going so we've had lots of rewind weeks where we've looked at the best yeah. uh you know great britain tries against australia or the best challenge cup semi-final when it should have been the semi-final weekend let's look at some of the best tries from the semi-finals um this last one um oh this last week which is up at the moment was um uh, the, the nations, the tier two nations, as they're called. So not yeah. England, New Zealand and Australia, but some of the some of the really good tries from those other nations. So we, we I think we had Tongan tries, Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Wales, Scotland. So, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's fascinating stuff. It's good to rewind some of those as well, mm. isn't it? And my, oh. my favourite part of lockdown has been um, the Challenge Cup things we did. You know, the, the Challenge Cup finals that we did on the BBC. Um, yes, right yeah. at the beginning, we've we've had two of those programs, um, and and I just I just love love what being a part of those uh, in a very small way in putting them together, but watching them, you know, brilliant, and um, you just get reminded, they, they, and I've been at them all. That's a scary thing as well. I didn't I didn't go to seventy three. The first one was seventy four, which was Warrington against Featherstone, but the seventy three, uh, Bradford Featherstone game, um, I wasn't at, but all the others you're at, and you look at them and you think. Golly gee, that looks really old. Mm. But I remember being there like it was yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously, in our neck of the woods, we were highly delighted because you showed the, the Halifax Saints one. Yeah. Um, I think the, 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 the one thing, the John Pendlebury, that tackle didn't get the full credit it deserved no, at the time. No. Yeah. He was, uh, yeah, it was purposeful, wasn't it? it, it, it yeah. I clearly believe that it meant to do, it was his last chance. Yeah, yeah. And we were saying, we were saying he was probably he was probably a Lance Todd winner that day. I know Graham Eady. Oh, absolutely, it? absolutely correct. Mm. I, I think if the Lance Todd trophy was selected after the final whistle, Pendlebury would have got it. Yeah. He set up Eady's try. He mm. dropped the goal, and basically that tackle was the difference between the two sides. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things we we did. Um, we had a thing called the Thrumall 13, which was a heritage project from when they were up at Thrumall. Yeah. And we had a display down in the Peace Hall. On one of the most remarked photographs is we've actually got a still of John Pendlebury's face being between the Saints players two hands and the ball being about six inches away. Yeah. Actually caught the moment he punched the ball clear. Wow. And, and everybody loves that photograph. Yeah, yeah. Well, Maybe not in St. Helens, but... No. No. Well, Mark Ely still gets a lot of stick, unfairly, mm. because, um, you know, there's not a lot more he could have done there, was there? No, 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 no. That's, uh... it, was just, it was just Pendlebury at his brilliant best, and yeah. it's not something you can prepare for, or it, it, it's just a, a momentary action. Yeah. Well, just, just to go back, I don't know what you guys felt, but watching all the, the older games, and the, clearly it's, there's a stark difference between how you know rugby league now in its performance you know um and again i'll go back to another thing that john said john burnett i, I think it was clearly because i was working in his pub he told, he told me all these <laughs> um it it, it it was it was alluding to it later in his days is that uh, when they played in that era it was 70 percent skill i think he said and 30 percent fitness yeah <laughs> but the game was moving towards the other way around yeah fitness and he believed 30% skills. Now, yeah. I think he was probably alluding to the fact that there's every position had its own job to do, probably. Yeah. For yeah. certain time in the, in the game. And now they become complete sportsmen almost, don't they? You look at them all, you get a, a, alluded to a number eight putting the ball in, playing another. You know, they all play each of the positions because they're immensely fit. Yeah. yeah. Does that seem a, a, an overarching sort of? Yeah, I'd agree with that because I mean, back back then, you, you, your open side prop forward, you know, was part of of hooking the ball in the scrum. 
you'd always have one prop forward who could do some ball handling. You know, he wasn't necessarily there to smash them to over. He, he, he was there to take the ball in and then, you know, lop it off. Mm-hmm. You'd have loose forwards. I mean, you know, you look at the number 13s now and they're, they're essentially another prop. Whereas then a loose forward had a very defined role. You think about Knocker Norton and, and, and Harry Pinner. Yeah. Um, and, you know, going back before that, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have memories of, of before that. Six and seven, you know, now it's one plays one side of the field and the other plays the other side of the yeah, field. Yeah, but yeah. in those days, you know, seven and six were defined. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot. And I think the big change was the 10 yard rule. Um, mm. two, two, big, two big evolutions. One, when we went from five yards. So at five yards, you had to rely on a deeper line. You had to rely on more skill. With a 10-yard rule, suddenly you just, you know, you can have five big, big drives forward, quick at the play, the ball, five, one out, quick drives forward. You can be down the field. You can be 50 yards down the field without mm. even thinking about it. Mm. Um, so I think that's one big evolution. And the other big evolution from the coaches is the wrestle. You know, we didn't have the wrestle. You mm. watch those games in the 80s and it was, I wouldn't say it was less structured, but certainly there was more, there was more creativity going on, wasn't there? Yeah, and it was. It, it was like, there wasn't the wrestle at the scrum. So it was get tackle, roll away, get on with it. Um, so I, I have to agree with you. That to me is that I think that's the bigger change than the 10 meter rule. And yet it was a 10 meter rule that meant teams had to do the wrestle. Yeah. Or you literally couldn't get back in the line in the seventies. Yeah. You did your tackle and your job wasn't to roll around on the floor. It was to get up, run back backwards and get in that line again. But you'd yeah. only five yards to go, so... Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what I want to do now, and I've done this deliberately, is actually take you back in time a little bit. Right. Because you've obviously worked in the what I call the old era and the Super League era. How was it for you as a journalist at the time of the changeover? Did journalists see it as a good thing or a bad thing, or were you just concentrating on putting the news that was happening out there? The big thing at the time was that rugby league got a lot more uh, space in the papers. And, um, well, yeah, yeah, we always, we can play. I mean, when, when, when I was working back at the agency at Wigan, so this is before, this is in the old era, as you put it, um, we would guarantee that if we got a decent story out of Wigan on a day, we would get a big piece in every one of the national newspapers, Daily Express, Daily Mail, Sun, Telegraph, uh, the Today newspaper, if you remember the Today newspaper. Yeah. Um, and But the, the difference then was that a lot of those newspapers had northern editions that were produced in Manchester. So the news desks, the sports desks, understood the importance of rugby league to their area. So they would give rugby league due prominence. And then what happened was that Murdoch came along and took the whole thing south. Um, all, the, the, all the northern editions were closed down and the Sun, the Express, the Mirror were all suddenly produced from in London. So rugby league lost a lot of momentum then. Uh, we didn't get quite as much of a spread. But then when Super League came around, it was such a big story in 96, you know, the switch to summer, the Murdoch millions, et cetera, et cetera, the nicknames and all the rest of it, that we got, we got, we suddenly saw a lot more publicity for rugby league. Uh, I mean, on Five Live, for example, I was, I was at Five Live at the time and suddenly from getting as not that much on the radio, suddenly we had a program every Sunday because there would be a match. If you remember in the early days, Sky would put uh, one of the matches on a Sunday evening and Five Live would have yeah. a commentary on that game every week. Every Sunday, there'd be a rugby league commentary on Five Live. Um, and even when there weren't matches on a Sunday, so, for example, Easter Sunday, uh, I still had to do a programme. We used to do it from our house in Queensbury, actually, mm-hmm. invite guests to our house, uh, and we did it from there because um, we had the broadcast facilities. Um, so, yeah, I think around that time, rugby league had a big chance to punch through and make a, a, a real name for itself um not long after the rugby league world cup in 95 that had been a real success you know with a welsh club potential you know you look at all the welsh players who were suddenly playing rugby league and who were back in the south of wales playing in that world cup and the, the interest that created mm-hmm. so 95 96 97 i would say was like a golden era for publicity and since then it's be, it's just tailed and tailed and tailed to the point where we are now, where it's probably the worst I've known it, uh, publicity-wise, 
yeah. and interest from the national media. And unfortunately, obviously, there may have been a little boost or buzz around the Ashes time, but yeah, of course, no Ashes this year now. No, no. I mean, yeah, that would have been that would have been fantastic if we'd have if we'd have done well in the Ashes this year. Mm -hmm. then um, that would have created... You, you go back to the 2013 World Cup, we had that heartbreak against New Zealand uh, at Wembley when Sean Johnson's last yeah. second try got New Zealand to the final. If we'd have got to that final, I think we got about 4 million watching the semi-final. If we'd have got to the final, we would have had about 7 or 8 million watching that final. And that might have been a breakthrough for Rugby League a little bit more as it was New Zealand against Australia, didn't draw that bigger, bigger crowd, didn't draw that bigger viewing figure. But next year, we've got the World Cup again, 2021, and 16 matches will be on BBC television, either BBC One or BBC Two. And when you think about that, it's only a four-week, five-week tournament. So 16 matches, you're talking about a minimum of three matches every week on either BBC One or BBC Two. Uh, so I think the profile of the game next October, November, is going to raise significantly. And if, if we can do well, if we can do well, if England gets to the final and win it, let's just, well, if they can get to the final, let's, let's start, with, start with that first. Yeah. Let's get them into the final. But if they can, then um, the, the profile of rugby league will grow massively, massively. And the women's game and the wheelchair game as well, both of which are going to be brilliant. Every single match will be on some BBC platform, whether it's online, um, on the website or whatever, every single match from all of those tournaments, the men's, the women's and the wheelchair, will be on, on the BBC. And then it's up to, to us and the rest of the rugby league family to, to work on the back of that and to get the game moving forward again, because we yeah. know it's the best game. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's persuading everybody else outside our own little bubble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I, I said in, in uh, to a friend you know, flippantly. Um, you can you always get the wags at a game, which is great, isn't it? You know, you get the ones who come out with all you know behind the post. They're, they're all over the place. Thankfully, you know, characters. You can see it coming, can't you? You know, try goes past. Say Halifax, let one in first. None of that social distancing now, mate. Get your tackling done. Yeah, <laughs> it's that sort of northern sort of say it as it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it coming. See it coming, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Malcolm, is there any other questions you want to ask? I'm good if you're okay with that. Just to touch on one little thing you know, you, you mentioned the, the wider family games there. Um, and clearly, I've got an interest in the wheelchair one itself, uh, and the growth that that's that's gone. If I remember rightly. Um, was it last year when you, you commentated on one of those? And that was a, was it first time you'd actually seen it live? Was it England over in Australia? Did you, I can't remember. Yeah, little... no, I've, I've never commentated on one. I'd love to commentate yeah. on one. Um, um, but we we had we do a podcast on five. It's funny you should mention this actually. Uh, we do a podcast every week on Five Live, uh, which goes out on the website, the sports what BBC Sport website. Um, and we did a, an interview with a guy called James Simpson who yes. is um, England International, Wheelchair International, who was serving with the army in Afghanistan uh, and had blow both his legs blown off um, when he tripped the device. And he's, he's, just, he's, just an he's just an incredible blow. You know, the kind of the stoic um, resilience from that. And he told his story. Um, and we've, a we've actually, we've, we've, we're putting the podcast out again today. Oh, as we okay. speak it's oh, going out against there we caught up with uh, james a little earlier I've, I've had a chat with james a little bit earlier about where he's at now but we put that original part of the podcast out mm. but yeah and so we keep saying uh, and a friend of mine said um in fact i'll tell you who my friend is and i'm not sure how this will go down in your part but nigel wood um said <laughs> when it, when he was chief exec at the rfl said to me if i could only show people 15 minutes of any rugby league any type of rugby league i would show them wheelchair rugby league because that embodies everything about the sport it's brutally tough it's inclusive because whether you use a wheelchair or you don't use a wheelchair whether you're able-bodied or you're not able-bodied you can play that sport whether you're man woman whatever yeah yeah so it's a great it's a great advertisement for the inclus inclusivity of our sport um, but so we had James on and I'd seen a few bits and pieces on YouTube and stuff, but I said, I must come to watch a game, mate. 
So he said, right, this was last year, we're playing the Challenge Cup um, final in Sheffield against the Argonauts from Kent. Mm. Why don't you come to that? So I, I went and I took my daughter. My daughter's a big rugby league fan and she's mithered her boyfriend into being a rugby league fan. So the three of us went off and didn't know what to expect, really. Um, but it was brilliant. It was absolutely sensational because it is rugby league. That's what... You with wheelchairs. See, you can see it, can't yeah. you? I, I remember yeah. when, it, when it was developing many years, several years ago. Um, and yeah, you're right. I, I was sent... Because I, I was caught up by... Uh, Robert Fasolet, who was a, uh, he, he worked for the French. <laughs> yes, that's right, and he, he works for the Ministry of Sport in France still, I think. So anyway, he wanted the game to come over to England. Uh, they'd received a huge amount of money through Axa Insurance, da 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 da, da to promote, and and he found me uh, coaching wheelchair basketball in Clackheaton through a friend of his at Bramley Rugby League Club. I yeah. had forgotten the guy's name, and he was the old family. Like, Try this when he sounds as if it, it should be, you know, da 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 da. And we were sent the rules in French, and my wife <laughs> translated them in, in schoolgirl French very well, as it happened. I thought, I can't see how this is going to work, but we'll give it a go. You're right. It's, it, you see it, you get rugby league, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I think it's been so successful in, in, in developing well amongst those. Because at Halifax, I'd, I'd say um, only a couple of players actually watch rugby league. The rest yeah. have learnt the game yeah, yeah. because they love this sport. Yeah. It's gone yeah. the other way around, really, you know. Yeah. It is. Um, but, yes, it's, it's, um, it's very watchable. Very watchable. And you'll, you'll know more about this, obviously, Malcolm, than I do, but there's, there are the two brothers in Halifax, one who yeah. um, is in a wheelchair because he had meningitis as a kid, and his, yeah. his brother, who, who is able-bodied, yeah. and they wanted a sport to play, that they could play at the same level, yep. uh, yeah. compete together at the same level, and that was it, wheelchair well, rugby league. Well, there's a little jump before that. Um, essentially, yes, but they came to basketball because this hadn't been invented yet. And I yeah, remember yeah. I was coaching basketball at Clecky in the same sports club. And these two, well, Harry must have only been about seven. The ball was bigger than he was, really. You know, yeah. and his brother were jokingly long hair, shut cut, uh, cut short. And, they were, and their mum was looking for something for them to do, just as you say. Yeah. And that was yeah. the start of the journey, really. I said, well, you don't yeah. come and watch, you come and play. Get, get, get your backsides in one of those spares there, spare wheelchairs, spare sports chairs. And that's where the game went. And Harry moved on into, uh, he was a dis disabled lad who is um, Great Britain Paralympic gold, uh, bronze medalist at basketball. And yeah. yes, they, they both went and won the World, Wheelchair World Cup for England the second year of its conception. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, he's, out, he's living in Spain and doing basketball. But yes, you're right. Jack and Harry Brown um, are the yeah. two we're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean that that is just that just sums up the inclusivity inclusivity of it, doesn't it? I think you know again as a as a sport we we can be so proud. I mean we are a sport that was born to be inclusive. You know, in 1895 this sport was all about giving everyone a chance to play, mm. um, and you know issues developed down the years, and 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 you know we're not perfect, mm. but I think we there's a lot of stuff that we do that we can be very proud of. We look back on our history. Uh, that we can be very proud of. Yeah, I, I mean, okay, just, sorry, just to jump in there, with the girls' game, um, my daughter grew up with sort of my dad having played through it all, and it was like, hey, lass, you shouldn't be playing this game, you know, da da da. And she, it wasn't structured really well, wasn't the amateur game then for girls playing. I think that to stop at 15, I think, she, right. she played up at Greetland, where all around is where I was in, you know, in a mix. Yeah. Field. Um, but look at it now. Look at it now. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, gone through the roof. Yeah, and that and that next year that that is they're not just saying it. It it is truly three competitions mm. on one platform. You know, it's the men's, the women's, the wheelchair. Yeah. It is genuinely all three together, and and we can we can just luxuriate in watching all three next year. It's going to be brilliant. Mm. Yeah, I can't wait. Absolutely, Ian. I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Well, first of all, obviously, on behalf of. The guys who are going to be watching this uh, online at the Heritage uh, Dinner Club people, and obviously from yourself and Malcolm, we'd just like to thank you for the time you've given us this morning. Um, 
I thoroughly enjoyed it. I always do. I, I, I sometimes come along to these meetings when they're at the club or online and I'm thinking, I get a bit nervous myself, a bit like you used to do. But it's like all the others have been, once you get people sat chatting about rugby league, then it's just a wonderful experience. As we said earlier, we're going to put this online for people who can't get out, you know, which is a lot of us at the moment. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you for your time. And you're the first we've done this way. Um, you certainly won't be the last. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Genuinely, thank you for the invite. Um, really enjoyed it. It's good to chat and um, just can't wait till Rugby League comes back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Gentlemen, right, thank you for that. I'll, uh, I'll press all the appropriate buttons and wish you have the rest of your day, you know, etc. is a good one. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Malcolm. Thank all you. Thank you very much. Ian. Thanks, Malcolm. Catch you, yeah. Catch you later. Catch you later. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Ta -da. Cheers. Ta -da. Bye now.